from lethal workouts to secret Beck hat tips. You season three is packed with tons of sneaky Easter eggs, callbacks, and pop culture references. Yippee ki movie lovers, I'm Jan, and in this video, I'm revealing 40 killer details you might have missed in season three of You. Spoilers ahead, so take care if you're not caught up. When Joe becomes obsessed with his neighbour Natalie, as we see him go off to snoop on her, he grabs his old trusty stalking cap, which has been placed on top of an Ernest Hemingway biography, a nod to how he dressed up as the famous author for Beck's birthday party in season one. Why are you wearing a turtleneck? I'm Hemingway. And it's also a hat tip to how the author came up during one of the dates Joe went on to make love jealous in season two. You know you're Hemingway. Very sexy. The seed for Joe's decision to get away from love and take Henry with him is planted in his mind during his conversation with Natalie, who comments that kids aren't handcuffs. It's a neat little remark that calls back to the literal handcuffs that Joe almost killed love with in the season two finale, just before she blurted out that she was pregnant with his child, stopping him in his tracks. He is the only reason I'm alive. While Joe is creepily stalking Natalie at the library, he stood right next to a stand of Scott Landon books, a wicked reference to the Stephen King novel Lisey's Story, which features a stalker harassing the wife of author Scott Landon. After Joe murders Marianne's ex-husband Ryan, as he walks away from the crime scene, he sarcastically comments, Always stay through Shavasana. A humorously dark reference to the yoga position commonly known as a corpse pose, which involves lying like a dead body on your back, which is how Ryan ends up right outside a yoga studio. When Joe and Marianne discover they shared a similar childhood as they were both abandoned by their parents, a connection between the pair begins to form. The beginning of their illicit relationship is also signalled by the fact they're standing next to a book titled Truly Madly Guilty. As Joe tries to keep his marriage with love on an even enough keel that she doesn't find out about Marianne and kill her, he gets his wife a present of an expensive casserole dish he's been looking for, and it's also filled with Donut Pal. This is a throwback to season two when Joe missed out on a trip for that same fresh strawberry and cream filled dessert with love. The things that this donut shop does with fresh strawberries should be considered a sex crime. And they were also the same donuts that Milo got for love when she and Joe broke up. When Love's mum Dottie drunkenly rolls up for some Mexican food, the place she goes to is called Tacos de la Madre, which translates literally from Spanish as Mother's Tacos. The choice of that particular food for her and Henry certainly isn't a coincidence either, because Dottie believes that Love's baby is 40 reincarnated, and in both the TV show and original books, 40 is addicted to Taco Bell. And of course, Dottie, like 40, was on a bender in that moment in the show herself. He's the reincarnation of my son, 40, and he loves Love's a good taco, don't you, baby? The name of the fictional town where Love and Joe live, Madre Linda, also reflects season three's emphasis on motherhood. In Spanish, it means lovely or beautiful or wonderful mother, a reference to how after moving there, Love initially finds herself struggling to fit in with seemingly perfect mothers like Sherry, a successful mumfluencer. Joe describes Madre Linda as the safest neighborhood in California at the beginning, but ironically by the end, it's become notorious for multiple gruesome murders and kidnappings all supposedly committed by the town's new, less than perfect mother, Love. A new character in season three is Theo, who has a touch of Joe about him with his feminist pretenses and somewhat obsessive romantic pining and pushy gestures towards Love. Similar to Joe, Theo imitates iconic romantic movie moments, such as the scene from the 80s movie Say Anything, where John Cusack holds up a boombox to prove his love. According to all the rom-coms of your generation, this is what the guys are supposed to do to get the girl. What Theo didn't realise, though, is that Love just isn't that kind of girl. I hate rom-coms. Take away my ovaries. In the penultimate episode, after Theo figures out Joe was driving Natalie's car the day she disappeared, he goes on to discover that the Conrads are currently locked up in the basement of Love's Bakery. It's at this point we get to see the Expand Your Mind t-shirt he's been wearing, a nod perhaps to what a mind-blowing experience all these discoveries have been for Theo. When Sherry and Carrie eventually find the key that Love hid in the cage, it turns out it was hidden inside a tub of vanilla powder, an ironic little detail given what Sherry called Love and Joe just before she started looking. Those two face vanilla 
<laughs> Notice also that the brand name on the tub is French, Le Meilleur, which means the best. Fitting given loves perfectionism when it comes to cooking. This is the best bakery in town. Shoddy lamination. Definitely didn't use French butter. Both Joe and Beck mocked the affectionate term babe in the first season. You said babe was a default for unimaginative lovers. And Love also hated the term when Milo used it with her in the second season. But if you call me babe again, I'm gonna stick you in the oven. So it's more than coincidence that when Sherry and Carrie arrive for the swinging session with Joe and Love, they start using the term with each other. Babe, I'm all over it. Making it a little signal on top of the many others of how the Conrads are really worlds apart from the Quinn Goldbergs. God, these people are so much more than I thought. Use writers have a bit of fun with the dramatic trope of Chekhov's gun when Joe discovers that Carrie brought a gun to the swinging session. This is a Chekhov situation now, isn't it? If I touch it, I all but guarantee it gets fired. The trope is fulfilled when Love gives it to the Conrads, who end up using it twice. Don't get hey. hysterical. I took hey. a seminar. Hey. Hey. Leaving Joe regretting not having it himself when he's getting beaten up by Ryan. New trope, wishing you had Chekhov's gun to fire. The use of the trope in season three also calls back to the second season when Forty drunkenly explained his feature film idea at Henderson's party. It's Chekhov's knife. And as soon as we see it, we know throats are gonna get cut. Forty, of course, was right, because when we saw Love expertly using a knife to butcher a piece of meat early in the second season, it was a big clue to the twist that she'd be revealed as a knife-slashing serial killer similar to Joe. Joe and Love's distrust of each other comes to a head in their last meal together, when Love cooks him a roast chicken, a callback to when they first met and she took Joe on a culinary tour of LA in search of his favourite food, which ended up being the roast chicken she cooked for him that night. Perfect bite? Perfect. The idea of Joe's perfect bite also came up in season three, when he was feeling guilty about Love making him delicious food while he was thinking about Marianne. Perfect bite, ready? I don't think it's a coincidence that in the library scene, where Joe thinks Marianne is starting to flirt with him, she's also putting away a book with the title Vessel, a signal that she's about to become yet another vessel for Joe to project his fantasies onto, his latest you, the next in his parade of replaceable, interchangeable women from Candace to Beck, Love, and Natalie who he can obsess over and fill with his idealised view of what a perfect woman should be, then toss aside when they don't meet his manufactured version of them. Joe's warped opinion of himself as a good man, a hero even, comes up when he compares himself to the fictional character Atticus Finch from the Pulitzer Prize winning book To Kill a Mockingbird. You're a steady stalwart Atticus Finch. This idea is reinforced later on when Love's mother Dottie says that Joe looks like a young Gregory Peck, the actor who played Finch in the 1962 adaptation of the novel. Marianne, however, makes a much less flattering comparison when she makes fun of Joe's look as he arrives at work after a photo shoot with Sherry. The whole vibe's very... Patrick Bateman meets Venetian Gondola. Marianne is on the money, of course, in comparing Joe to the fictional serial killer and unreliable narrator from American Psycho. And later on in the finale, she reveals she did have her suspicions about him. When Love is thinking about having a second baby with Joe, a daughter she hopes, she seems to settle on the name Julia, which is interesting as Marianne's daughter is called Juliet, which means little Julia. Of course, Joe's name begins with a J too, and in a flashback, we also discover that Joe's mother had a new son called Jacob after she gave Joe up. Perhaps like Joe's mother then, Love is subconsciously trying to replace Juliet, the daughter of his new obsession, with her own little girl. A shout out to a liar who noticed that when Joe takes on the pseudonym Nick at the very end, it's likely a reference to Nick Carraway from The Great Gatsby. Similar to Joe, Nick is the narrator and a character in F. Scott Fitzgerald's famous novel, and there have been many other Great Gatsby references through the series. For instance, Joe reads from the novel to Henry in the opening episode. In season one, Beck and Joe refer to themselves as Fitzgerald and his wife Zelda. And then there's Forty's habit of calling Joe old sport like Gatsby does. Joe taking on the name Nick might additionally be a subconscious reference to Dr. Nicky, who he framed for Beck's murder, and who I think could be coming back for season 4, which I talk a lot more about in my season 4 theories video. 
As Matthew waits for Theo, he reads about the events in what the media's dubbed the Quinn Goldberg Butcher House. An article in the real-life online women's magazine The Cut reveals that Love's reported murder-suicide has inspired memes, art and even a K-pop viral hit titled Pie For Me, Die For Me. A nod to part of Joe's body being baked in a pie, akin to the infamous human meat pies made by Mrs. Lovett in the tale of the serial-killing barber Sweeney Todd. Apparently Love's original name for her bakery was Love Muffin, both a euphemism and a throwback to how she used to leave those sweet treats in Joe's locker at a Navarin. Muffins. Yeah, I uh, seem to remember owing you one. The article explains that Love wasn't able to clear the rights to the name, which could be a real-world in-joke, as it is actually the name of a single's website in real life. And curiously, it's also the name of the antagonist group in Disney's animated Phineas and Ferb. Disney should sue these people. The article's accompanying photo is from Love and Joe's wedding, and its depiction of a blood-covered cake with a bride murderously bashing the groom from behind is a humorous callback to Kiki's cupcake order at the top of the episode. Can you make two dozen bloody-looking ones by tonight? I'm having my true crime book club over to dish. Both Love and Joe's use of the poison wolfbane on each other is a twisted reference to the special love language they created between themselves in season two. I wolf you. I wolf you too. And thanks to Valar Mogulis for pointing out that Wolf is also even the brand of their oven, which Joe uses to burn love and their home to the ground. And for a full breakdown of more details you might have missed in the season 3 finale, tap here to watch my ending explained video or follow the link in the video description. Just before the credits roll in the first episode, a screen appears in honour of actor Mark Blum, who played Mr Mooney, Joe's surrogate father and bookstore owner in New York. Blum sadly died in March 2020 from complications arising from COVID-19. So what other details did you notice in Season 3 and what were your favourite moments? Let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, then a like and a share are hugely appreciated. You can tap left for my full you playlist, including the season 3 ending explained, or tap right for my season 4 theories, including whether love could still be alive. Thanks for watching and see you next time, yippee ki movie lovers!